What is up, my friends, and welcome to the UFL Week in Review, one of the longest-running UFL podcasts in human history. This week, we've got an explosive lineup for you, so much to get to. We're bringing you an exclusive interview with Kenneth Farrell of the United Football Players Association, talking about everything that went down with the union. You don't want to miss that. Plus, we're diving into the UFL to NFL pipeline with 19 players making practice squads and some even cracking the 53-man roster. Plus, Memphis head coach Don DiFilippo resigns from the showboats. We had the scoop on that. We'll get into that. So stick around for all these stories and more on this week's UFL Week in Review. USFL is in business. The XFL is underway. There's no doubt spring just got stronger. All right, we're here with Kenneth Farrow, former XFL player, uh, and had a bunch of stuff to go. We wanted to bring him on to talk about all this union stuff. So before we get started, Kenneth, I guess uh, kind of give everybody a background of your history in the spring football world. Yeah, yeah. So I uh, appreciate you having me on. Uh, y'all have done an amazing job kind of covering the spring level for a lot of years now. So definitely much appreciated. Um, yeah, my first year in the spring league level was 2019 back in the AAF. Um, from there, got a got a trial with the Dolphins and then winded up back on the XFL roster in 2020. And then uh, took a couple of years off to try to get the union thing off the ground and then wind up getting drafted by the Renegades in 2023. And that winded up being my last year. Um, got a championship, but unfortunately I tore my ACL mm. the halfway through. But uh, but it was fun to kind of get back out there. And, uh, you know, I was back at home in, in Dallas-Fort Worth area. So it was cool to be back out there one last time. And, um, and now we're back in the union space trying to kind of get everything back up off the ground and, uh, running for these guys going into this season with the UFL, with the merger and all that good stuff. So, so how did you kind of um, formulate all like the union stuff? Cause you guys, there was this whole, I mean, you know, the AAF players, the season was basically canceled. They were cut out, you know, they were stuck in hotels. I mean, is that where kind of the, all this started? Yeah. You know, I think the, what really got us was obviously the AAF was a crazy situation for a lot of guys. Um, and then the following year, COVID shutting down XFL in 2020. Um, but we really just kind of took it upon ourselves uh, because there was the there was some open bankruptcy cases. Right. And so AF was bankrupt. XFL was bankrupt. And we were kind of in the dark about where to file claims, how much we were getting and all that type of stuff. And so that's when we started a, a nonprofit organization at the time. Um, just to be able to kind of get a collective entity to be like, hey, this is where we're going to, you know, kind of call home base for the guys that are playing in the spring league. And so we were able to help, um, I would say, about 80 percent of the guys in the AAF kind of recover the, that bankruptcy claim. We got the deadline extended and we're currently working on um, getting the XFL from 2020 bankruptcy payouts. Uh, getting guys the correct information that that distribution should be going out in October or November. So that's kind of really what started us was the bankruptcies. Um, and then obviously being in some of the situations that we were in, we felt like, Hey, if we don't get a union um, there's been a couple of, you know, circumstances, whether it was, you know, the XFL, they had put out a salary that kind of started floating around the public and we got there and it was, significantly lower than kind of what a lot of guys thought we were going into that situation. And uh, yeah, that, that, that was kind of what did it. And then um, yeah, just trying to make sure that guys are protected uh, at this level is something that, you know, we kind of set out from the beginning to do. And, you know, luckily we're here with the opportunity to be able to represent guys for the first time the UFPA will be able to uh, this year. So it's been a long journey, a lot of learning. Uh, we went through bankruptcy one-on-one -on -one about three or four mm -hmm. times, you know, <laughs> just making sure that guys are, are getting, getting everything that's out there for them. And then, so the XFL went down, but then the USFL came up. But then the USFL players went with the uh, steel workers. So how, and I know that there, you guys were kind of involved and then they were involved. Do you want to talk anything about that? Yeah. So that, that, that's kind of been, you know, the big, um, I guess, confusion point amongst a lot of not only players, but kind of, you know, anybody who's kind of been paying attention to the space. So originally when we set out, you know, to, get the union up off the ground um we had we had reached out to quite a few different unions we had got to talk with the nflpa a little bit we got to talk with you know 
Teamsters, a couple other unions, and the steel workers were, you know, kind of the only ones that were like, hey, we'll help you all right now. Um, we didn't really get anything written on paper to say like, hey, the UFPA will be the union to be able to handle, you know, the things that come along with, you know, negotiations and grievances and stuff like that. That was just kind of the the shared, we shared it verbally as a vision of the UFPA being able to be the union. Um, and kind of not knowing what we didn't know at the time, uh, obviously in the thick of still trying to play and get to the NFL and, you know, do those things. We were just like, hey, we got help. You know what I mean? Let's move. Um, and the steel workers did help us a lot. Um, so basically, we at that point in time, after the 2020 is shut down, I'd actually tore my plantar fascia right after the season ended in 2020. And um, I couldn't get surgery because we were cut off from insurance. So you know, some of these situations that, you know, you guys are going through, you know what I mean? We've dealt with firsthand. And um, at that moment in time, the steel workers hired us on as organizers with the long-term goal of the UFPA kind of being the union. Right. And uh, once everything got organized and the USFL players, we got enough card signs to for the guys to vote. Everybody voted. Um, yes. For the steel workers at that point in time, we were kind of notified by the steel workers of, Hey, Y'all can no longer be a part of this because y'all aren't active players. And that was kind of never really talked about prior to yeah. that. So we kind of got blindsided. Uh, the players definitely got blindsided because, I mean, at the time, the steel workers were letting us be on Instagram, UFPA this, UFPA that. And then once the election went up, they're like, yep, no more UFPA steel workers. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, no, no, um, no bad blood or anything. I just think that they went about it a little bit deceitful you know at, at that time and um unfortunately i think the reason why you know they kind of saw the passion of what we were able to do as far from an organizing standpoint they knew we would never be okay with the amount of the percentage of the dues that they would be taking from the guys union mm -hmm. under them especially when you're talking about 400 guys that are only making fifty thousand. um it was upwards of you know 50 50 percent of how much dues were getting not you know uh, directed towards their local, their association of players. Mm -hmm. And so that was the number one thing that kind of rubbed us the wrong way. It was like, okay, when the dues started coming in, we were no longer able to, you know, have a role in anything that went on. And so from that standpoint, we were, you know, we were persuaded by not only us, you know, we wanted to finish out kind of the vision that we had um, put together long-term, but a lot of players were extremely unhappy with that. And, um, and so from that point on, we went on, we went along the route of trying to figure out how we could set up as an independent union. Um, hindsight, it was, you know, very easy, just not, you know, having the, the legal knowledge of how to set up an entity in, in that way um, definitely could have, could have been avoided, but we learned a lot throughout the process. So now we do have our LM1 status. We are a labor union filed under NLRB and, um, as of, as we speak right now, the steel workers had actually pulled out of the election. We had got enough. We had talked to all the guys this season. A lot of the guys were, you know, pretty adamant about, you know, kind of getting us in the at the seat and uh, to be able to do the bargaining and just kind of run the union and run the players' association how you know we would want it to be ran as players. You know, with communication and transparency and you know, in my mind. You know, these a lot of these guys are my former teammates, if not about 20 percent, you know, that at some point in time have been my teammates. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there's been a little bit of confusion. But to be able to, you know, look all, you know, my peers and teammates and, you know, uh, colleagues and I and let them know, hey, every single penny is going here, here, here. That's kind of the transparency level we want to be able to run this players association at. And we feel like we're plenty equipped with the knowledge and and the uh, the team to be able to go in and, and do some good things for the players. So we were able to get the independent union up off the ground. We were able to get the card signed. And now there's election going out. Guys are actually currently receiving mail in ballots to be able to vote for us. And with the steel workers withdrawing from the election, there's really nobody else. Um, so we are excited about kind of the future. We feel like we can really start to build a, a strong line of communication and be able to just have the transparency that, you know, we feel like these guys are due, um, at the end of the day. Um, so yeah, that's kind of a, a short version of it, but it's been, yeah, it's been a lot of, you know, trials and tribulations to get to this point.
So what happened? So we had the USFL and, and then those players went with the steel workers. Then the XFL returns under the rock. There was no union there, but during the season, there was rumblings about the NFL PA. And then the XFL players said no to the uh, steel workers union. And right. then we moved into the UFL merger. And then I mean, can you kind of walk us through the, that the XFL part and then the merger part? Yeah. So when when the um, once we got once they kind of gave us the boot after 2022 saying, hey, y'all aren't active players, we were a little bit taken back. But at the time, I mean, we kind of just evaluated the situation and said, well, we don't have a union entity. We can't get to the table ourselves, regardless of what just happened and how, you know, we were just you know, let go of kind of very abruptly and kind of blindsided. We knew that like, at the very least, there's a union in place for these guys. So we were like, okay, well, you know, just kind of, you know, take it on the chin and keep moving forward and kind of see what starts to develop. And so once we got drafted by the XFL, we had another meeting with, you know, the kind of higher ups from the steel workers. And we were like, Hey, you know, once we're into the steel, once we're into the XFL, and these guys are, you know, talking about organizing again, there has to be some major changes that go on as far as kind of the structure, the autonomy of, of how this union is going to be ran. If we're going to organize again, you know, try to organize underneath the steel workers. And at that moment in time, there was, there started to get a little bit of, you know, disgruntled guys working with the, uh, the steel workers union, the, USFL PA is what they called it, but it's really right. just a local of the steel workers. There was no separation there. It was all steel workers, right? And so um, there was a little bit of confusion on that end um, because one, we were completely kind of pushed out, right? Um, Ryan Cave, one of our other members, was able to stay on and help with negotiations. And that's when you saw the $1,600 living stipend kick in. And I think it was like an $800 raise from 4,500 to like 53 mm -hmm. from 22 to 23. And um, so we kind of go into the XFL season in 2023 under another verbal like, hey, once the XFL is up off the ground, we'll reconvene, we'll make changes to bylaws or whatever we have to do to make sure that, you know, we're in more of alignment of, you know, being able to run a little bit more autonomously uh, with the Players Association. And by that time, it was too late. You know, there was a lot of upset, upset guys with the USFL Players Association. And then rumblings started coming from, I think, more so guys that just didn't know um, at that time, mm -hmm. thinking, okay, well, we don't like the steel works. We can go with the NFLPA. Not knowing that we had already talked to the NFLPA, they have no interest at all whatsoever at, oh. that, at representing us. You know what I mean? So it was like, yeah. So once that rumor started to spread, I mean, once guys hear NFLPA, you know what I mean? It's over with. They were like, yeah, we should do that. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. we talked to DeMorris. We talked to all those guys. No, no interest there. So, um, gotcha. so once that kind of went down and the, the steel workers uh, got voted down. That's when we were like, okay, you know, here's kind of our chance to set up independently. And then sure enough, the merger happens. And so with the merger, we really felt like because it was a merger and because the, the UFL was basically a new entity that got created, everybody got their contracts terminated at the end of the year in 2023. Um, I believe that's the correct date. Yeah. 2023. Everybody was terminated. And then in January, the steel workers come out and recognize themselves as a union. And there's no employees of this new UFL league and nobody's under contract. So wow. we were like, that doesn't really make too much sense. So we started kind of doing our research and um, um, it wind up falling under the category of uh, unfair labor practices, um, which is what we had to go and file because we felt like there was an illegal recognition. We felt like nobody voted on the CBA. They adopted the CBA from a previous league that had shut down to implement into a new entity league, the UFL. No votes on the CBA, no votes on, you know, whether or not the steel workers were going to be the union. So we just felt like there was a lot of things that weren't done properly from a labor standpoint. And uh, we were able to kind of put those things in motion to kind of, I guess, put a little bit of, you know, pressure on on them. Um, and ultimately, when we were able to trigger an election with, you know, a lot of the players signing, you know, our authorization cards by the end of the year of this 
past season, um, that's when they kind of decided to back out. You know, I'm not sure, you know, whether, you know, I'm not really sure too, too much of the reason, but I know we did have pending charges and, you know, um, obviously a, a small kind of grassroots union, you know, with very strong ties to all the players. I don't know how the election would have turned out, you know, in their favor. Mm. So that's kind of where we, that's kind of how we got here today. And so now um, with the merger and the UFL and all of those things that have transpired over the last couple of years, um, these guys will have their first opportunity to vote for us as a players union uh, moving forward. And then, so, so at the end of the year, there was cards to join any union or was it just basically yours? And then that was it. Yeah. So are they, or the steel workers? No. So, so the steel workers were identified by the league as the union already. Mm -hmm. And so there is a 30 day window in, in labor, in, in the labor world, there's a 30 day window before the CBA expires, where if the, if the union members and the players feel like they want to go with a different union, that's the time window they can submit and a file petition to get an election up. And uh -huh. so there was no other cards except for us because we were the only union, you know, working to try to uh, basically uh, be, be able to represent the players. And so uh, once the election was filed, that's when the steel workers withdrew. Um, and so now there was supposed to be a ballot with the steel workers and us, uh, mm -hmm. but they withdrew. So now it's us or, you know, no union. And so, like I said, our hopes is to be able to connect with these guys and be able to get everybody on the same page. We feel like our experience and, you know, everything that we've been through and just the, our members on our team give us more than the knowledge that we need to be able to go in there and um, get things done for guys. I think, you know, one of the biggest things is there was a couple of things that hit the headlines about guys running out of insurance because this year was the first year that, you know, they didn't have the year round um, health insurance. They got mm -hmm. cut off. Um, so it's just going to be, you know, simple things like that. But, you know, I told the guys, you know, on, on several calls that we've had already is like, Hey, this, th we created this entity. Um, so the players could really take a, a control of kind of what goes on. Um, you know, we're not some, you know, superpower with 900,000 members, mm -hmm. right? This is just grassroots. We played, we feel like we know best. Ryan Cave has done three CBAs in the arena league. Um, and, you know, once you play the game for this long, I mean, it's there's a very few people that we can't pick up the phone and call, whether it's former players, um, you know, former general counsel to, you know, leagues or anything like that. So we have a very strong network and we feel like we can get uh, what needs to be done, uh, you know, achieved for the guys for sure. And so uh, now that so this vote is coming soon or uh, when is this vote happening for the with the players? Yeah, so I I believe the the uh, I believe September nineteenth is when they kind of count the tally and, and and count the votes. So um, so we've just been talking with players, you know, texting, email, Zoom calls, just kind of it's it's been a uh, it's been a hassle just going through everything that I just explained for guys. Imagine mm -hmm. being a player and you see UFPA with steel workers and everything starts to, you know, fall apart. And then they were sending out their little propaganda, you know, <laughs> information on us and where we started. And I'm telling guys, I was like, Hey, you know, we interviewed the steel workers, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. at the end of the day, so, um, so it's just been a lot of just informing guys, educating guys on what's going on now. So yeah, September 19th, they'll count up the votes and, you know, as long as everything goes, you know, how we see, uh, we'll be able to step in and be the uh, representative for these guys moving forward. And hopefully with a, uh, with a strong line of communication with, you know, every player that, that is on the team. this mm -hmm. year. And then, so how is your relationship with the management of the UFL now with Redbird and Fox? You know, we 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 had good relationships back in 2022 with Fox. Um, you know, some of the people that we got to talk to, they were I thought they were very, um, you know, open to to the union itself. Um, mm -hmm. I think a lot of times, you know, we kind of get caught up in, you know, the, the presidents of the league and stuff like that. But when it comes to negotiations and the people running, you know, the operation, um, like you said, Redbird Capital and Fox, you know, those aren't necessarily, um, you know, football people, if you will. So I think they really uh, they took well to us, 
um, being able to establish the union. And then obviously we have, you know, relationships with, with, um, with guys like Daryl Johnson. He was a former GM of mine in the, um, San Antonio in 2019. And, um, you know, even guys like, um, you know, Rick Schaefer, he was general counsel to AF, um, guys like Polian, you know what I mean? So we have a pretty strong network of guys who really know the spring football space, um, from that side of things. So we're pretty confident that because we, we're not trying to come in and say, Hey, everybody gets paid a hundred thousand. <laughs> we understand, you know, the economics of kind of what's going on at this level, but there are some things that we feel like have to be in place just for the safety and just the, you know, well being of the players from a year to year standpoint, you know, these guys go through, you know, 14 weeks of football, then try to make an NFL team. If they do make an NFL team, you're looking at, you know, 30, 25 plus games that these guys are playing. So making sure that we have the proper things in place to make sure that they're protected from a, from a health standpoint um, and a resource standpoint, I feel like, you know, there's probably nobody else that can do it better than, you know, the players that have played these leagues in the last four or five years. So would you be negotiating with like Daryl Moose Johnson or Russ Brandon or like some Um, other people? Like, how does that all work? I guess fans are curious. Yeah, as of right now, we believe it will be Fox. Um, it looks like Fox is going to be the ones that do the negotiation. Um, not too sure if Redbird Capital will be there. Uh, we'll find out here pretty soon in the next couple of weeks, you know, kind of what that looks like. But I know it was Fox in, in the last two years with the USFL. So Gotcha. And then, I mean, you know, t- we're talking about big name players, A.J. McCarron. He's somebody that, you know, has talked about the players and, and the future of the league and how important it is. I mean, has he kind of been involved in any of this stuff? Oh, yeah. And AJ has been pretty vocal about everything. Um, but like like we said, we we tried to we really tried to keep all this stuff from, you know, being a whole mess. I think, you know, with what I just explained, you can kind of see how that could blow up and go crazy on Twitter. Mm-hmm. We've had a couple of guys kind of pop off not knowing all the information and just kind of say some things that were just, you know, a, a lot of, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, it just wasn't true. And so, um, yeah, AJ McCarron is definitely a guy that's been an advocate for us. Um, the whole St. Louis Battlehawks team. And you got to think the XFL voted the still workers down already. And mm-hmm. so um, a lot of those teams were already in the know of kind of what was going on. So, um, but even some of the USFL, former USFL teams, we talked to the Birmingham team, uh, a lot of those guys before they were, they got out and, you know, they hadn't really heard too much from anybody all season and the guys were paying dues. So I think, um, I think we're in a really good space where there's a good, uh, there's a good solid number of guys who really understand kind of what we're trying to do. Um, and that are, like you said, kind of key names within the league, um, and they're going to be able to contribute. And like I said, we we don't want this to be a, hey, you have the union, you have the players. We want this thing to be just one cohesive unit moving forward. Uh, the union is just something we set up to kind of protect ourselves. So I think as we start to get closer um, to, you know, the season approaching and we start to have our meetings and kind of get everybody on the same page, you'll kind of start to see more and more support from some of the bigger names in the league. And then, but some of the, with this vote going on, I mean, there's still like, not everybody's under contract, like right. with the, with the UFL, like how does that work? Right. So that, that's been kind of a complicated part of it and something we had to figure out. So it's basically everybody from the bargaining unit um, at the end of the season last year. So you got about 60 guys that are all over the place in the NFL, I think 70 uh, now. Right. And so, you know, all those guys will have a chance to vote and be able to contribute to to the mail-in ballot um, and the election, uh, which we encourage everybody to do. Like I said, we want this thing to be, um, you know, really, um, really filled out by the players. Um, you know, this isn't something that we just made and say, hey, we're going to take off and, you know, do this all ourselves. We want mm-hmm. this to be a co- cohesive unit. So, and I think the players that are not playing – or maybe somewhere else, or maybe they're done playing, they kind of understand the significance of, you know, what we're trying to do. So I think those guys will will show up and kind of put in their ballots um, as well. So, yeah, I think, I think overall we're in a really good place just because we have been able to talk to so many guys face to face and really break down, you know, the ins and outs of everything that has transpired in the last couple of years. 
Okay. And then, so is there any final things you want to tell players or fans out there before we uh, wrap this up? It was very, yeah. very informative, very interesting. And a lot of the fans are very interested, not only what happens on the field, but, you know, they have a vested personal interest in the league. So they want to know how things are going on behind the scenes. So I appreciate you uh, letting us in on some behind the yeah. scenes detail. But uh, yeah. yeah, is there anything you want to put out there? Uh, yeah, um, I think, you know, for the guys that come across this, um, you know, we are, I mean, we, we've we got we got contact information from everybody. So just, you know, guys, if you're seeing this and haven't been in tune to the email or anything like that, um, definitely get in contact with our socials. Um, the United FB players on, on Twitter and Instagram is kind of, you send a DM to either one of those, we'll be able to, you know, kind of see that you sent that and get in contact with you right away. And then UFPA union.org is a website um, that you can kind of stay up to date with. We got a calendar on there for guys. So if you uh, are haven't got the email or haven't got a text, we'll kind of have our calendar zoom meetings um, just kind of schedule it out on there. So guys can kind of see where to tune in. And um, so, yeah, I mean, this, we're not, you know, we're not going into this thing trying to be any type of, you know, source of entertainment or, you know, creative mm-hmm. content. And you know what I mean? This is strictly for us as players to be able to have a voice and be able to get to the table and kind of talk about the things that we all know we need. So um, to the fans, you know, I think we, we've definitely saw, we've definitely seen, you know, how much support that y'all, have, you know, given these spring leagues and, you know, y'all are definitely kind of what makes it go. So, um, you know, just super kudos to y'all, you know, kind of showing up year after year. I know this thing has been, you know, kind of a roller coaster to try to get something off the ground. So we're excited to see the UFL go into the second year. And like I said, we we by no means are trying to, uh, you know, bleed the pockets or anything. We just want to make sure that we got our basics covered and uh, keep moving forward from here and keep continuing to help grow the league uh, more than anything else. All right. Well, Kenneth Farrow, appreciate your time uh, coming on the show. Yes, sir. I appreciate it, Mark. So the NFL preseason is done. We have the UFL to NFL players, 19 in total so far on August 29th. That is sure going to flicker, move up, move down. But this is where we've got it right now. So 19 players in total are on NFL practice squads. Birmingham Stallions leads the way with seven players. All different kind of wide receiver, cornerback, uh, QB, all sorts of stuff. We'll break it down for you here. Uh, first of all, let's just go right to the list, shall we? Um, so the Birmingham Stallions, DeAndre Tillman, offensive linebackers, Denver Broncos, Kevin Austin Jr., wide receiver, the Saints, Adrian Martinez, quarterback, MVP, New York Jets, Jordan Thomas, tight end, goes to the Atlanta Falcons, A.J. Thomas, DB, goes to the Patriots, uh, Jonathan Garvin, defensive end, goes to the 49ers. And Deion Kane, wide receiver, goes to the Buffalo Bills. One thing I want to point out, and I mentioned this in the article, the average salary for a practice quad player is $12,000 a week. So it is a win if you're a player and you get to actually be on a practice squad because you can make $12,000 a week, which is way more than what you made. I mean, even if you were in there for five or six weeks, I mean, it's more than you'd make in the UFL. It would be great if one day the UFL can get to the level of practice squad pay with their league because then that would kind of be an interesting decision. But it's not because really the players will still play in the practice squad player, but who knows? D.C. Defenders, America's team, Liam Fortinale, uh, offensive guard for the Patriots. Malik Fisher, defensive end, was with the Texans. Two wide receivers again, Kelvin Harmon, Dallas Cowboys, Brandon Smith, Jets. The NFL keeps taking our wide receivers. Ugh. Michigan Panthers, Nate Brooks, cornerback, goes to the Bengals. Walter Palmore, defensive tackle, goes to the Panthers. Nate McCrary, uh, running back, goes to the Packers. Um, I said Palmore is the Panthers. EJ Perry, quarterback, Jacksonville Jaguars. What's up with um, Nathan Rourke? They didn't keep Nathan Rourke. He bounced around, but they keep AG, EJ Perry. And now Nathan Rourke is back in the CFL. Huh? Okay. Um, San Antonio Brahmas. Cole Levayo, offensive lineman with the Jets. Julian Davenport, offensive tackle with the Falcons. Rex Sundarhara, long snap for, for the Browns. And Anthony McFarlane, big-time running back with the Miami Dolphins. 
There is where you have it there. We also have a breakdown that a notable that Battle Hawks, Roughnecks, Memphis Showboats did not have any players signed with NFL practice squad. Arlington Renegades have defensive end Jalen Redman landed on the 53-man roster. And, of course, Jake Bates is rounds up your NFL players in the NFL for now. This is going to change. This is going to be fluid. This is going to be up and down. These guys can get picked up, dropped. I remember when the XFL uh, had its first season, and I was like, all right, I'm going to write an article you know, about all the NFL, XFL players uh, making it to the NFL. And it was like they were on it for three days, and then they were cut a day later. And then, I mean, I followed Jordan Tamu, and I was like, I can't write every time these guys get signed and cut. So we'll focus on signing uh, throughout the offseason, and we'll see. But this should kind of, you know, cut down day. We should be hearing soon maybe about the XFL draft or a UFL draft. All right, two UFL players made the 53-man roster, and that's typical when you come out of the USFL or the XFL. You guys might get one or two guys making the the 53-man roster. Most guys stick with the practice squad. The first one is former Renegade star, uh, makes a roster spot with the Vikings. Jalen Redman is your guy with the Vikings. Dominant force for Arlington in six games where he amassed 18 tackles, or 18 tackles, five tackles for a loss and four and a half snack, four and a half sacks. Uh, he had the highest grade Viking uh, preseason thing for pro football focus. So he got laid. Um, he was a part of there. Redman has been uh, since college. He was with Oklahoma. And the other player, of course, Jake Bates, no shocker here, makes the Detroit Lions 53-man roster. We'll have to check on him. Um, of course, he's famous for his 64-yard uh, field goal for the win. Had a good uh, season with the um, – at least a good spring season with the Detroit Lions. So he'll stick on there. So congratulations to him. He was all UFL team recognition. And we all know about his history, his college career, et cetera. So Jake Bates, you got two UFL guys make it to the NFL 53-man roster. As this league progresses, you will definitely see more and more of this in the future. With more players, I should say being on the 53-man roster rather than just one or two. Welcome to Pulse AI Solutions, where cutting-edge AI technology meets business innovation. Are you a small to medium-sized business looking to transform your operations and stay ahead of the competition? At Pulse AI Solutions, we specialize in AI consulting, delivering custom solutions tailored to your unique needs. Our team of experts designs and implements AI-driven strategies that boost efficiency and drive growth. From AI integration to tech innovation, we provide comprehensive support every step of the way. Join the revolution. Our custom AI solutions are designed to help businesses like yours thrive in the digital age. Experience the future of business with Pulse AI Solutions. Visit us at PulseAISolutions.com and transform your business today. So we broke the exclusive Memphis Showboats head coach John DiFilippo resigned. So we had this broken, and then the UFL came out a couple days later uh, that John DiFilippo had resigned as head coach of the Memphis Showboats. The decision appears to be DiFilippo's, though details, of course, remain unclear. They did put out a press release. Showboats struggled 2024, two and eight. I really thought that they would be a lot better, high powered offense. I was really excited for them. They also have the first overall pick in the UFL draft. The coach change follows the August 2nd departure of general manager Dennis Polian, leaving the showboats without key leadership. So I was concerned that perhaps um, they would be doing something with the team. Maybe they weren't coming back. Uh, he joined Memphis as leading the USFL New Orleans Breakers to a 7-3 and record in 2023. So it was like, okay, maybe he had a bad year. Experience includes roles with Cleveland, Minnesota, and Jacksonville. Now, speculation, we have not heard anything yet. They're going to have to make a decision soon about potential placements. I threw out Anthony Blivens, former defensive assistant uh, with the Birmingham Stallions championship run, could be a candidate. He was a coach slated for the Las Vegas Vipers. Jalen Horton is a lot of kind of fan favorites. He was the defensive coordinator of the Pittsburgh Maulers with his father. He was a guy that people's names were coming out to. Uh, so we'll have to kind of – 
see where that's going. But he had 15 seasons with eight NFL teams, quarterback champ, coach of the 2017 Super Bowl champion Philadelphia Eagles, got a curse cousin to his uh, an historic passing season in Minnesota, and he overcame an explosion stylopolis diagnosis during the 2023 season. Remember that was he couldn't even walk. So uh, I haven't heard anything about that as far as, um, you know, well, it wasn't any kind of health things related. Now, here's the other kicker. Sources have kind of told us USFL, UFL officials will be at the first Memphis Tigers home game on August 31st, which is just a couple ways to assess Simmons Bank Stadium renovations. And from there, they'll start talking about season ticket patch, packages, which they kind of already did, but like locations, whatever. So Memphis is in. There is no changes. I assume that the schedule will still be the same, but – we have one coaching and GM vacancy. It'll be interesting to see who fills that void. This one we've been sitting on for a while, um, and it kind of came out. But the Battle Hawks are to hosts, and we put kind of put the teaser out there on social media on the Twitters because it's not X. Um, about that there was talk of the St. Louis Battlehawks hosting six home games in 2025. Why? Because there's a problem with the Alamo Dome. So we, at the conclusion of the, we heard this from sources, the, the conclusion of the saying that the Al Alamo Dome already had major event commitments for the months of April, May, and June, which occur, of course, during the 10 weeks of the UFL season. One major event, the 2025 Men's NCAA Final Four weekend, April 5th and 7th. Now, that is one weekend, but still, there's a lot of prep and things to go along with that to set all that up. Followed by, they also have Disney on Ice is another thing on that weekend tour. And I'm hearing that there's more events as well that hasn't kind of come uh, out yet. So UFL, of course, News Hub broke the story uh, before the official announcement came out. So along with the Brahma season ticket information for the 2025 season, the UFL released the following. United Football League today announced the St. Louis Battlehawks will host six regular season games in 2025 with the San Antonio Brahmas visiting the Dome and America Centers twice. Quote, as we planned for the 2025 season, our process from a league standpoint was to assess availabilities at our venues to create a schedule that works operationally across all eight markets. Russ Brandon said, after reviewing venue availabilities, we decided the best option would be to add a six home game to St. Louis in order to best fulfill our team schedules. We are grateful for the support our partners, the city of St. Louis and the Dome has given us. Maybe that's the game that we travel out for. The Battle Hawks are three and one all time against the Brahmas with the only loss coming last season in the 2024 XFL Conference Championship game. All four games between the two teams have been decided by 10 points or less. Uh, more information about the game and the full UFL schedule will be released at a later date. We're hearing sometime maybe in September that actually they do have um, things kind of wrapped up is kind of what we're hearing. Uh, the first opportunity to keep their seats at a special price. Of course, we assume Battle Hawks fans will turn out for this, quote, away game much more than if it was in San Antonio or San Antonio moved their games to Houston the home of TD ECU Stadium, which we're hearing they're returning. The UFL is returning in 2025. Uh, the XFL's Roughnecks played there in 2023, but had to move to Rice Stadium due to renovations. Arlington Renegades, Games, home of the Choctaw Stadium, again, would be a venue, but a sparse crowd. St. Louis, of course, is the best option by far. If both teams are competitive, it would be great for the UFL to be able to fill the dome six times rather than five. Remember, that is a lot of money, that dome brings in for the ufl and to add a six game there it's actually a no-brainer even though it sucks for these uh san antonio brahmas it's still fantastic for the league to generate more revenue because we want more revenue going into the league because we don't want it to go away so it makes sense it's unfortunate though I mean, now that they have a team in place and, 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 and marketing we've had this whole off season hopefully we get the schedule we're hearing that it's all wrapped up We'll get that schedule soon in the beginning of September. This way, season tickets and ticketing people can kind of do their things. We can really um, show out this season. Well, I already renewed my tickets. Make sure you renew yours. And maybe this is the game that we head to St. Louis to go to the St. Louis away game in St. Louis. So we'll just have to see when the schedule comes out. So this was an article from military.com about the Ar Army is seeking $6 million refund, refund from the UFL because of their recruitment deal 
so remember last year they had $11 million partnership with the Army. Apparently that yielded no new recruits. And Dwayne Johnson was supposed to um, do uh, Instagram posts. He only out of he was supposed to do five. He only did two. Uh, internal review projects loss projects a loss of thirty eight potential enlistments due to the partnership. This is I, I don't I don't I don't this is interesting. So let's just get into it, and I'll give you my take. According to the report, military.com, United States Army is seeking to recover six million from its eleven million dollar marketing partnership with the UFL a deal that failed to generate a single recruit. This has been going on. Not It's not just the UFL's fault. It's just that people, none of these partnerships have done that well with the amount of money that's coming out to it. So documents obtained by author Steve Bainon revealed that the U- Army and UFL collaboration, which began early uh, this year, has not met the, its intended goals. The partnership included prominent Army branding of UFL player uniforms and during game broadcasts throughout the league's inaugural season from March to June. I mean, that was everywhere. You couldn't watch a game without seeing the United States Army logo any there. Remember the Army Replay Center? So in that respect, the US, UFL certainly held its end of the bargain, but it seems the plan included a bit more key component of the partnership involved UFL co-owner Dwayne The Rock Johnson promoting the Army on social media. The Army valued Johnson's posts, this is Instagram posts, at $1 million each, expecting five posts to his 396 million Instagram followers. However, Johnson only made two Army-related posts with none since April. This shortfall in social media promotion contributed to the partnership's underperformance. That's the part that makes no sense. I mean, I can make an Instagram post right now. Um, and if it was worth a million, I would do it. What I've been trying to ascertain is how involved Dwayne The Rock Johnson is. And it's very, I, I'm kind of hearing that his, his involvement is very minimal, you know, a very small partnership um, with the league any, anymore. Like, and as far as ownership goes, it's v- not a lot is what I'm hearing. I'm trying to gather that, but that's kind of the vibe that I'm getting that he's not really Danny Garcia is also involved a little bit more, but again, they're not big owners. I mean, it's Redbird and Fox all the way. Um, so I don't know if that had something to do with it, like where he's, he was involved, but now he's not involved because this was part of the UFL. And so who knows? Um, so that's what we've been hearing about that, but Maybe by the time at the time of the deal, both Johnson and Garcia were all in, as this would have been part of the XFL. But with the merger and when the UFL season started, Johnson was kind of out, so he was not on the hook for those posts anymore. Just that's just kind of my hunch. But aside from the UFL playoffs, we haven't really heard much from Dwayne the Rock Johnson promoting the UFL at all. Has he said anything about players making the league? Um, so, but this is the, this isn't the first time uh, Military.com reported negatively on the UFL Army partnership was two days after The Rock made his first two Instagram posts about the Army. Clearly, the timing was not coincidence, and that was the last, uh, the first and last time the Army had mentioned was mentioned on his Instagram. Army spokesperson uh, Laura DeFrancisco stated, we are in the process of working with the UFL to determine the final cost. An internal review conducted by the Army projects the partnership may have led to a loss of 38 potential enlistments how, I don't even understand how you quantify that, but okay, this outcome is particularly concerning for the Army, which is currently facing historic recruiting crisis. Um, Army planners, this was from the article, Army planners use various metrics to judge whether time and money could be better spent in other efforts, and the effort and resources spent on the UFL were seen as service as a net negative for recruiting. Okay. The article does point out that the Army did spend $80 million in advertising with NASCAR. It did not get a single recruit either. So there you go there. Flashy headlines aside, this is more about the Army. No matter how or where they spend their advertising money, they're not able to land new recruits. It's not NASCAR or the USFL's fault in that matter. Uh, again, that's what we think. The one thing that we were taken back by the report, because UFL News Hub had been hearing throughout the season that things were going well with the Army, and they were looking to re-up for year two. And there was actually people in on the ground during those final games of the season um, supposedly talking to the army about, you know, reing up for next year. So let's just kind of hold off on this before we kind of rush to judgment. Uh, I'm trying to work the angle and seeing if, um, you know, 
we can get some more information on that. So stay tuned to UFL News Hub because I am working. I'm working this story and see if we can get some more information. Maybe have somebody come on and talk about it. But that was kind of a definitely a negative damper. It was both of those articles were kind of negative uh, towards the Rock, but again, splashy headlines. But I mean, I, if you're spending money and you're not getting recruits, that's that's pretty. You know, I don't know what else they could possibly do. Maybe they're trying something different. But it will be interesting to see because that was a major sponsorship for the UFL, and they need those kind of sponsorship deals and how this translates to other sponsorships and how they try to land other things. We Who knows? But uh, we will just have to stay tuned and find out. Welcome to the heart of the United Football League. Welcome to UFL News Hub phone app. Our phone app is designed for the true UFL enthusiast. UFL News Hub brings the game closer than ever before. With our phone app, dive into game previews, get expert analysis, and never miss a beat. Download it today on the Google Play Store. Anticipate every play with detailed game previews and analyses. Understand the strategies, the matchups, and the pivotal moments that define every clash. Relive the excitement with in-depth post-game reviews. Break down the key plays, the results, and all that shape the thrill of the game. Go behind the scenes with exclusive interviews and content. Meet the stars, the coaches, and the personalities that make the UFL shine. Stay ahead with comprehensive news coverage. From game schedules to injury reports and league announcements, we've got you covered. Navigate with ease through our intuitive app design. Enjoy regular updates, ensuring you have the latest features and UFL content at your fingertips. UFL News Hub is more than just an app. It's your gateway to the UFL universe. Designed for fans of all levels, from the casual follower to the avid statistician. Join our community. Live and breathe the United Football League with UFL News Hub. Download now on the Google Play Store and stay always in the game. Version coming soon for the iPhone. All right, we are back. Real quick, we'll hit our news and notes segments. So of course, the Arlington Renegades offer special discounts from ticket members. All this stuff is coming out. New food and beverage. We didn't get that. Let's see, uh, pregame sideline passes for one home game per account. Uh, commemorative items for season ticket members. Priority access to renew the same location. Discount merch on UFL Shop, which they always have. Priority access to purchase additional seats at season ticket member pricing and of course access to purchase seats for playoffs and championship game uh, priority access to events for example meet and greets town halls chalk talks virtual autographs digital press conference more that sounds like a lot of fun um, early gate prices for concessions until the end of the first quarter online only so you can renew your tickets for the renegades showboats came out with their stuff uh, of course, they're doing the renovations on the stadium uh, and information surrounding the Memphis showboats came out about Simmons Bank Stadium. Uh, when we told you about that representatives will be there during the UFL season, showboats had uh, during the 2025 UFL season, the showboats will have chairback seats on the west side of the stadium available for sale, as well as bleacher seating in the end zone. If needed, chairback seats on the east side of the stadium will be made available as well. Showboats will communicate full ticket information, pricing, and information on how the renovations will impact areas such as access to restrooms and concessions, parking, and entry. Showboat fans can rest assured that the renovations will not impact our ability to play in Simmons Bank's Liberty Stadium in the 2025 season, said Steve Macy, the Showboat's Senior Director of Team Business and Event Operations, and they give you there. So not the official official, but, you know, Hey, this is kind of where the seating will take place, but you can see there's a lot of renovation going on there, and um, the showboats will be back. San Antonio Brahmas, of course, they also came out with their season tick stuff. So did the D.C. Defenders, but this one was interesting because, of course, um, they have the problem with the having and playing a game. So there's only four home in San Antonio. So you get two complimentary tickets to home opener. Invite a first-timer, which I like that. Season ticket member only entrances each home game. Season ticket member only lines at select merchandise stands on game days. That's kind of cool. Exclusive season ticket member team partner events, uh, offers rewards, team partners, opportunities to choose exclusive game day experience. Choose a different opportunity for three home games, one participant for each ticket and account example, post-game autographs, pre-game sideline passes, high five tunnel, complimentary and early release 2025 Brahma's Festa medal. I like that. Minimum of three exclusive season ticket member events, priority access to other events, the discount, 
and special ticket offer for a Brahma's road game of your choice. So all these things. In addition, those who renew their membership before September 16th will be entered in a drawing to win a VIP package that in private suite, pre-game field access, merchandise, and more. So, I mean, there's really no excuse to not. If you're a fan of the UFL, you should be a season ticket holder. This helps the league. I know you can get cheaper seats, but really $20 for a seat, like just support the league, will you? So I recommend everybody, I demand everybody to get your season tickets because that's going to help the league. Trying to get the biggest discount on tickets to get into a game is not going to help them. So we're upgrading ours to club level, which we'll be hearing something soon. That's our plan. Do we do like our spot, but my spot has like a bar right in the way, which is kind of annoying. And I really just love the, you know, the food that you can eat, the drink, drinks, special entrance for DC defenders and the rumor defenders will be the home of the game. That is rumored. I have confirmed that in a couple places, but I'm not really saying that's kind of what's out there right now. And it would make sense. You could fill that place up. Um, hopefully the DC defenders will have a good team this year. But even if it was St. Louis, anything, and they have the beer snake as kind of the central focus of the championship game would be a lot of fun. You have all of the DC defenders. I, w- I don't want to call them hoodlums, but uh, dignitaries will be there. So I think it would be a lot of fun. So stay tuned for that. Um, if you need a job, so I, I don't know. I think I talked about this. So you, know, you guys all know my story of my wife, how she has cancer. She's doing well. Um, we're going to find out next week, she's going to get a bone marrow test and, and then we'll determine whether or not she has to do a stem cell transplant or not. We're hoping that we can push that off because apparently a stem cell transplant, you can only do once, uh, and it lasts for five to seven years. But then if you tried to do a stem cell transplant again, it's the law of diminishing returns. It might only last six months, uh, to put it in super deep. So we're hopeful that maybe that we can just not do that and just keep with the drugs, but she's doing good. She's tired. She wants to go out and do stuff all the time. But uh, she's doing well. So thank you for your thoughts and prayers to that. And on the, so in the same couple months, I also got laid off from my job. I'm not sure if I meant. So yeah, my last day is the end of September. And so I'm currently looking for a job, figuring out what I'm going to do. Yes, this does not pay the bills whatsoever. This doesn't even pay for a pizza uh, for me. So anyway, but the UFL, if you go to the UFL.com, they actually have 25 right now job openings, ticket sales, member services, director of marketing, director of performance marketing. Not really sure what that is. VP of partner strategy and solutions, analytics and reporting. This one just got it added. What is this? As integral hire business intelligence group as the UFL looks to expand its data analysts and storytelling. This role will support the uh, senior vice president of strategy and business intelligence, setting the direction of our data program and related reporting reporting including the informing of various business strategies data visualization ticket sponsorships venue reporting so uh, so there's a lot of jobs out there if you're looking to join the ufl part of uh, vp partner strategy and solutions this role helping achieve its ambitions of becoming one of the most innovative sports leagues in u.s in the u.s for commercial partner individual will harness a massive opportunity to create valuable and unique platforms for our brand partners by working across league functions as well as broadcast part uh, f- partners uh specific the focus of this position is on national partnerships however due to unique ownership structure where the league and teams are all one and there's an opportunity to look at partnerships differently than more established ufl is looking for someone who wants to mark make a mark on the industry by redefining sports partnerships creating lasting platforms for partners creating industry buzz around great work oversee the creative development sales positioning and introduction of new sponsorship assets I'll work with business development meet creative content content, blah, blah, blah. So, yeah. So they, I mean, they're adding stuff and this is all just to juice the league. Remember they kind of went in, even though they cut the, uh, the coaching salary, um, which we haven't really heard if they're coming, you know, who's coming and who's not coming back. I hope they all do come back. Um, but there's a lot of jobs out there for the UFL. If you're interested in any of those, just go to ufl.com, which is good. This is what you want to see the way more than what it was last. They kind of got rid of who they needed to. They kind of have their, this is the skeleton crew. And and really, I always tell you, this is the make or break year for, for the UFL players. This is something that I would be all over. So my daughter is playing flag football in high school this year. They're doing it. So, um, I might even be the stadium. And we believe that I do have a resume, UFL, uh, an XFL, USFL, CFL. So I will be, I could potentially be doing that. So you might, if you're at a game game, you might hear my voice, but, um, I was like, first of all, NFL players, if I'm paying 
Patrick Mahomes $100 million. He's not playing in the Olympic flag. Fo- the UFL players should be playing in the Olympic flag football team. Like, let them try out for it. Not NFL players. You're right in your training camp. It is I know you guys want to do it. Like, I don't want Lamar Jackson to tear his knee at a, at a flag. The UFL needs to be all over this flag football. This They need to have flag football games going on at halftime with bringing young kids in that play flag football. Let them play on the field for 10 minutes or just have a little scrimmage or even a practice on the field. Um, they should do that with boys. They should do that with girls. This brings the families out. This brings the schools out, especially now high school season is over. So they haven't really been practicing, um, at least for the girls side of things. But again, bring those flag football leagues in the markets that will bring in people. I think and the UFL, could you imagine if it was the UFL players on the Olympic team? That would be huge for the league. It is a missed opportunity. Be all in with flag football, UFL. I am telling you, be all in with that. Um, and I have a whole article about why that is a good idea. I wrote that in um, latest stuff. We're going to wrap it up. First of all, we kind of decided to go away with the forums. We have a discord. There's discord in the show notes. If you want to join our discord, I'm thinking that we want to build a community somewhere and we need your feedback. So we still have the survey. So you can still take the survey on the website and let us know your thoughts on stuff. I'm like, do I go back to the original xfl kind of layout do you guys like this layout i'm kind of like mick when it comes to that um so fill out the survey we have the discord channel we're working on the merch when it comes to the blood donation stuff i actually have been giving plasma because uh, i need the money so there you go and it helps so i've been doing that um so take the survey also we are going to revamp we have just i wrote um the ufl app and we're actually going to uh, so basically what I'm going to do is taking the X old XFL app and I rewrote it using the UFL. We did have a UFL app. Wasn't really going anywhere. I was using .NET Maui. I rewrote the whole thing using, uh, Android studio. So, and it is good and it's got ads on it so I can actually make money off. And so that's coming soon, very soon within the week or so. Um, you'll be able to download it. If you've downloaded our XFL news hub app, this will replace that one. If you've downloaded the new UFL News Hub app, you're going to need to uninstall that and install this new one. There's not a lot of people. There's like 40 have installed it. So we're just going to go back um, because I want one platform. You can see what it looks like if you uh, download the CFL News Hub app. And then I'm going to move into the iPhone app and start working on that after I finish um, this show. Actually, I'm going to start training myself so that I can create that app and hopefully get that done by October would be the goal there. So we're so we can have an iPhone app. There's going to be an Android, a whole new Android app. So stay tuned. Don't do anything just yet. And you got that coming out as well. And I've got new glasses. So uh, there you go. Just trying to mix things up. Life is short. Have some fun. Mix things up. This is the latest. Appreciate Kenneth Farrow coming on. Kind of gave you the whole deal when it comes to the union stuff. So we should have some big announcements coming in September. Um, we're, we're still working on the UFL uh, fantasy football app. That's going to be worked on too. Actually bringing in some people to help with that. If you want to help with that, email me podcast at UFL News Hub. And we'll have another episode next month, uh, if not more breaking news or whatever like that. We'll get back on the tip one stuff. So anyway, that is it for me, folks. As always, God bless. Uh, make sure you like and subscribe. And I will see you all later.